Right. Welcome everyone to the Flux Dev meeting. Today is the 11th of May. I just had a quick look through um, the meeting notes from last time. There is no outstanding action items. And we're moving a couple of agenda items first, because we're still waiting for folks. Um, first, I wanted to give a quick update on, on graduation. So um, the TOC came back to us and said, like, you know, the, the, we're happy with all the answers you gave so far. Uh, there's a couple of um, tasks in flight that is, that is absolutely fine, but they defined one blocker, which is basically that we re work with uh, tag contributor strategy to revamp our um, governance. And um, basically we're in a state where we could theoretically merge the governance update. There was just one last question brought up by Michael, which is around um, um hope is to explain it um certain types of decision that that require um the vote of all maintainers and i think that's that's something we can fairly easily um fix i think there was a good suggestion by michael and and Hida. Uh, i think just somebody needs to find the time to put this into into words everyone is happy with um Today I'm going to be busy with with KubeCon prep. So if anyone feels compelled to um, do yet another commit to this huge PR already, um, please, please go ahead. And thanks everyone for your input and, and reviews. Very much appreciate that we had such a quick turnaround time on things that usually take a lot longer. The other items um, that were brought up like moving the flagger domain and moving the flagger docs and all the other stuff is almost done so um i think we're, we're looking pretty good yeah we i transferred the domain to cncf and i've checked today and the domain is no longer in my control it, cncf got it and it's hosted on dns simple um, the downside to this is that every time we need to do a redirect or add a new domain or something like that, we have to reach out to CNCF. We no longer have any kind of access to their DNS simple account, but uh, as they said, we can use the ticketing system and in 12, 24 hours, uh, someone will uh, yeah operate on the dns changes uh, we don't have that many changes so i think it's it's totally fine even if it would be way better to have it like flux cd under our control in uh, where, where do we have the dns for flux it's in it's where the website is right i don't know i think we also needed to hand that over to um to the CNCF. Yes, but we can uh, fully control the um, the DNS uh, entries from mm. uh, how you call it Netlify. Okay. So the DNS of fluxcd.io website is in Netlify, and that's why we were able to do uh, redirects for uh, the toolkit docs to the flux dogs from the old flux dogs to the okay. website and so on. So essentially, if we move um, the Flagger website to Netlify, we will need to work with the Linux Foundation to get the DNS updates fixed. And then we just place the redirects how we like them. And then basically we're done. Yes, and we'll we'll have to do that for uh, so the flagger docs are hosted on on uh, Gitbook, mm -hmm. the SAS, so we don't have any control there. But uh, for the flagger uh, homepage, the landing page where it explains what flagger is and so on, flagger.app, that's hosted on on GitHub Pages, 
and it's impossible to do any kind of re redirects and so on from there. So as with fluxcd.io, the next step will be for CNCF to add to the Netlify account the, flag the flagger app domain. So we can publish the flagger app website through Netlify and uh, get rid of GitHub pages. And further down the road, then we could uh, redirect flagger.app to fluxcd.io slash flagger or however we want to call it. Super. Um, I mean, once KubeCon and all the other stuff has happened, um, I think I'll, I'll find out from the Linux Foundation because they uh, control everything now, um, if they have a Slack or something so that we can coordinate with them a little bit more quickly just to check if, you know, the DNS settings actually worked and, you know, we don't need to go through the ticketing system because yeah. this time it took a bit longer. Cool. Well, okay. We'll get there. Any more questions for graduation things and the governance stuff? Cool. Um, which of the agenda items do we want to do next? Based on who we have here in the meeting. Or are we sort of blocked? I can take up something if <clears throat> nobody else has something. There was a there was talk of adding uh, libgit2 support to flux2 because you can't at the moment you can't bootstrap uh, to a git v2 server. So I just wanted to know if there is any interest for that or is that uh, should we should we do that? Should we foresee that? What do people think? Yeah, my. I hope that we could get rid of OpenSSL and LibSSH2 and use the native uh, Go transport in LibGit2. But when I asked uh, Paolo, he said that's not compatible with Azure DevOps. So, um, we are not getting anywhere, even if we say, okay, we can compile um, libgit2 cross-platform and we can statically link it to the Flux CLI using the Go native transport, but that will not solve anything because reasons Asia DevOps does things differently from anyone else. Um, yeah, we need to investigate how can we statically build, link, compile all the C dependencies of um, libgit2 into the Flux CLI without breaking Windows, uh, I don't know, Raspberry Pi, and all, all the platforms where uh, the Flux CLI currently runs. Raspberry Pi and uh, Mac OS are already covered because we uh, built those for the tests. The only yeah. problem is going to be Windows. Uh, the other issue is going to be that because you're working uh, as a CLI, opposed to being, well, kind of a, a background process is that I think, uh, for example, on macOS to properly configure HTTPS, etc., cetera, um, you may want to have a different configuration around um, OpenSSL. Is he not using OpenSSL? Using yeah. Uh, Mac you want to statically build libgit2, I think, and then dynamically link to all the preferred libraries for that platform. 
And because there is an assumption that the CLI is being run by a user, you can make a, a larger assumption on the types of, of uh, dynamically linked libraries that will already, already be present on the um, on the user system. The only problem I see then is because we also have a Docker image, um, it can be, become more difficult to uh, fix our Docker image to be set up to run the CLI. Um, but we could then maybe yeah, not sure. No, those are all areas of concern, basically, which require answering. Yeah, for macOS, uh, you can specify the open SSL libraries using an environment variable. Uh, like you can specify the path to the open SSL libraries. But yeah, I'll have to look into it further as to how we can make sure we don't break support for other stuff. So the uh, lead G2 Maintainers told us we shouldn't be using OpenSSL on macOS because that's not how things are supposed to run on Mac. They, you are supposed to use the native libraries and implementations that Apple bundles with their operating system. And I kind of agree. I mean, we said, don't worry about this because we are currently only running it in a container and that container is a Linux container, but um, their recommendation should be taken into account if we move this to the client, which is the CLI. I'm guessing they recommended that because OpenSSL has issues on Mac. Uh, just a point on that, if we're using you know, manage transport, then we would be doing that, right? So we would be using the Go native um, libraries, but it's still using the libgitu kind of code. You joined the uh, late, That's right? right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because at the beginning of the meeting, I said that you said uh, that uh, the native Go transport is not compatible with Azure DevOps. And that's the whole point of using libg2 in the CLI so people can bootstrap with Azure DevOps. But if that doesn't work, then... Yeah, so basically some issues that I was having with uh, DevOps was actually related to something else within managed transport. So I think now that is working fine. <laughs> so in theory, we, we don't have that problem. Uh, I have two setups, well, with HTTPS and also SSH against Azure DevOps and it's working fine. Uh, it was just one of the implementations of managed transports that it, it wasn't really working to, to the level uh, I was expecting, but now I, I'm having no errors at all, which because is a good news, right? <laughs> so if I remember correctly in source control, there is a thing that detects Azure DevOps and disables uh, manage transport altogether? Did you remove that? No, so that was a PR that is still on, and I'm you know, not sure if that will ever get merged. Uh, so what I was doing that is disabling, yeah, well, I was disabling uh, managed transport on that specific case, but that is not merged. I will share that PR here. So basically there is a lot of changes in the last while, well, most of them are merged yet. Uh, so the two key things is the key optimizations, which is a bit on the side, but another one that I want to merge soon as well is removing the caching of connections. From my test, that actually has improved a lot you know, across all the providers I've, I've tested against, which was um, um, Bitbucket, GitLab, DevOps, and, and GitHub if I didn't say that twice, uh, and without the need of caching uh, connections, but also improving from the Git2Go implementation, which had like a few workflows that were not great at all. For example, they don't, they don't reuse the connection on subsequent uh, actions for the same operation, uh, which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Uh, so, for example, that the second PR kind of does that and resolve those kind of problems. So, I will share here the two PRs just to see if we are on the same page. So, the one that you mentioned is yeah, fixes issues with managed transport. So, that I'm not sure uh, we ever 
gonna merge. There were a few things there, which was the ability of being able to set per Git repository if you want to use managed or unmanaged. Given the improvements that we've done, that wouldn't be useful anymore. Um, okay, so this this was the one. Okay. Yeah, so this is a, a different one. The other one that actually fixes a lot of the problems we we experience is this one, which I want to to merge soon as well. Just thinking whether to put that under a feature of the gate or not, because a lot. Of, yeah. If you. Have you seen the comment from uh, the person who you asked to uh, try out the image? Uh, yeah, one of the guys confirmed that it, it fixed. The other one, he had an issue, well, because I think one of the images I, I shared was not image automation. Yeah, then I would move just forward. I mean, the feature is already experimental. So to feature flag, a feature flag. Um, Maybe it's too much, right? <laughs> I mean, if you have one confirmation that it fixes an issue and in your own test it hasn't uncovered another issue, then it's obviously better than whatever there currently is. So given it's already behind the experimental flag, I would just go ahead and uh, work based on a single confirmation. Otherwise, cool. we are delaying it for other people who might not be so eager to uh, try it out. Oh, one, one, one thing about giving people um, preview images. Let's use only GitHub container registry and not Docker Hub or some other random stuff like Quay because uh, using your GitHub account links to your GitHub user, which is a contributor to Flux and so on and give some confidence to end users giving them a Quay or Docker account, which they have no way of verifying is this the same person? Uh, why am I running this stuff in my production cluster and so on? Um, so yeah, let's... Yeah, another... could you have like a kind of approach that we always follow and it's like the same? The, the approach is to use release candidates. Okay. But release candidates can only be published from branches which are not from forks. So even if you are a source controller maintainer, you still use your personal forks. So we cannot publish these candidates. The reason I'm not always doing that is because I often have conceptual things. And basically the release candidates are not getting cleaned up. So I don't want to have a lot of release candidates with conceptual things hanging around in our main repository, which adds up to the index of tags. Um, and then it's easier to basically publish it under your own account where you're building it anyway um, and share that. But I'm most of the time doing it from a GitHub account, sometimes from a Docker account, which has the same username, but I get your message. Yeah, username is not anyone can use your username or take over docker hub have you set up two-factor authentication on docker hub Kido? i've set up two-factor authentication wherever i can set up two-factor authentication uh this is new so you should probably set it up uh it does not remember the passwords every time even on the same browser if you visit docker hub you have to log in again with two-factor um, but yeah, it's a small downside. I have it enabled already. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, let's try and use GitHub and our own accounts. I think that's best. So we could include disable connection caching on, uh, on the next release, right? Paolo, do you have more things to do here or can you mark it ready for review? Yeah, that definitely can. Uh, so, so the key thing on that is, I was really keen on getting managed transport enabled, well, as an opt out feature, right? Enabled by default, but people can opt out. Um, so I was just wondering whether we want to do that kind of change before then or not. From my test, it is a lot more reliable 
Um, and also, again, as is, it is experimental, maybe if we test a bit more, then fine. Um, but I'm definitely keen on getting managed transport, you know, the default was well, sooner rather than later. So from what I've been helping Flux users, like everybody's on experimental Git transport since months and a half ago, because like if you create a standard um, bootstrap on EKS and GitHub, only one, one in 20 or one in 30 uh, pushes will actually work without experimental transport. So it's almost impossible to use it without experimental transport. The image automation controller, right? Yes, on GKE, on my clusters, it, it doesn't fail that often. Uh, it doesn't time out that often without experimental transport. But on EKS, I don't know what's happening. Maybe there are multiple hops from GitHub, from uh, AWS to EKS. Maybe Google has better latency. I don't know what the reason was the reason, but I can say for sure that image automation is not usable on any kind of EKS cluster uh, without experimental transport. And I've been using it on all my clusters locally and so on. I haven't seen any kind of issues with it. While without it, from time to time, even on my local cluster, which is, I have a very good connection with the latency is minimal for GitHub, I still see, let's say, once or twice per day a timeout. With experimental transport, I haven't seen like zero timeouts everywhere where I'm running Flux. Um, that's that's my feedback. I'm for enabling it by default on the next minor release. Brilliant. Okay. So just to confirm on the point on the libkit 2 on Flux 2, so that would be enabled with managed transport, right? So then folks have the exact same thing as they would have when it's running from the controllers. Yes, if it has been proved to work on Azure DevOps and AWS uh, Cloud Commit is called? I think so, Cloud Commit. Um, then yeah, from cool. Windows. So the, the ultimate test is build uh, Flux to the CLI with libkit2, add that flag to the bootstrap, run it on a Windows machine against an Azure DevOps account and against an AWS uh, cloud commit account. And if those two things work, then yes, we are fully ready to deploy this. Uh, cool. Do we have Windows uh, runners in GitHub, do you know? Yeah, we do. Great. Okay, so we can in the Flux two repo we can actually have an end to end test for Azure DevOps running from a Windows runner using the Microsoft account that we have for for testing. Good. I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. Yeah, so and I my proposition is to figure out the, the build step and do a quick test uh, in a Windows VM, see what's going on. And if it start break that, yes, do a proper pull request tests and everything else. But first, uh, yeah. Try to test it out so you don't work for nothing. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just add some import statements first and then see if it compiles in the first place. Yeah. Can we move to the next item? I guess so. I think it's the Helm OCI support status. Yes. 
So we have to decide if we want to um, do a minor release flux two and all its controllers uh, before KubeCon and include uh, OCI support in there. Uh, he then I did the review of the pull request. Uh, we know that there are some um, missing features. For example, uh, you can have uh, umbrella helm charts with dependencies. So you have an umbrella uh, helm chart in your Git repo with dependencies to other charts which come from OCI. Right now we we do have support for uh, having uh, an umbrella uh, chart in Git and have dependencies to uh, uh, HTTPS uh, or HTTP Helm repositories. Um, but I don't think uh, this missing feature should block us from releasing OCI support. What I would do is state this um, thing on the pull request. Let's create an issue for uh, doing a follow-up and do the dependency check and solve address all the comments in the current pull request. And if we are confident on it, release it uh, today or tomorrow. What is your uh, feeling, Sule, on all of this? Well, I think I think we are not ready for the dependence, the dependencies from Git. There are a few things I think we have to think about, notably the login, because when you have a registration to do the login and the way we do it today, where we have a, a, function, a callback function to to check on the Helm repositories to be able to pull the dependencies from those Helm repositories. I think we need some thinking on that side before we can make it or we can implement this. So for sure, we won't be ready for KubeCon for this. And the other things, the TLS, the TLS uh, custom certificate that are not ready as well. But as you said, yeah, I think this can come Later on, for now, we can release it as experimental that we just delivering OCI registries based hand charts and release it like this. Um, but releasing it today as well, I think we need to leave time for for the people in the in the team so they can they can have time to review the the pull request. I think I would like at least. Paolo to review it because I was talking with him about uh, the login options. Um, yeah, so I, I would like people to review the pull request, make sure I have time to address all the comments, and then we can release it. So maybe later in the week. Yeah, on, on that point, I will have a look as soon as we end this meeting. Um, I saw that you, you've done some work on, on the last chat that we, we had. Uh, but yeah, I will review us once we, we finish this meeting and I'll give my feedback. Okay, so uh, what to do for Sule? Uh, please edit the pull request description and list there all the things that are missing and all the things that are required from your perspective for this pull request to be merged because I have here to do reset fetch failed condition as soon as fetch succeeded. Is that to do done or is not? There is no mention here of- This is done uh, for me, I'll check. Uh, yeah. I will edit the pull request and note yeah, everything you said and everything that is needed for it to be done. Oh, and another thing that's missing is um, spec documentation. 
Yes, that's I. I, I and that's very important because yeah. we spend a lot of time on fixing the specs, uh, spec and getting it in line. And if we merge it now and we have not a stable base for the documentation, then mm -hmm. no documentation is ever going to be written in the next yeah. month or so. Oh yes, yeah, Stefan made a comment on this. I will be working on it. Yeah, I should have added as a blocker in the review. I made a mistake. It shouldn't be a comment, but. Yeah, I definitely agree to Hide. We cannot merge anything without proper documentation. And after this is merged, uh, we have to um, update the Helm guide, which is the gate uh, for new users into Flux and Helm. So we definitely have to update the guide there and, and give people um, an example of, hey, you can also do this from OCI. It's, it's a minor change, but it must be there uh, in the docs right after we, we release Flux with OCI support. I can do that. Uh, I'm So if we are going to do the release this week, I'm going to do all the releases for all the controllers. I have some, uh, I need some help around uh, packages. So I've merged uh, Sanskar pull request around rate limits where we ask the cluster, hey, do you have uh, fairness enabled? Uh, then we no longer use the client side uh, rate limits. And this requires a runtime release. So you have to to release uh, the runtime package, then update the runtime package in every single controller, because we don't want this fairness to be enabled only in some controllers. We want all the controllers to behave the same. So it's important to bump this everywhere. And there is also a new Kubernetes release. Client Go, APIs, everything. So I'm, I'm thinking of bumping uh, the Kubernetes dependencies on all our packages and then do a runtime, do a runtime meta API, everything, do a, a, a release of every single package. And then when we go into the controllers, we can uh, update them all. Um, I would also switch to go 118 in in packages, but just for the uh, CI part. So we we know for sure that what's in packages can be vetted with Go 118. And after that, after KubeCon, whatever we can look into switching all the controllers as well to 118, or we can just switch the CI right now everywhere. Do we have any concern around 118? So to just a quick one, uh, I created a niche already for this, but on source controller, there's one test that we depend on a X509 search that is signed by SHA-1. Uh, which Go 118 would kind of break. Uh, there is a user that volunteered to work on that, but um, I think he hasn't come around to it yet. Uh, yeah, I've been in touch with him. Cool. He has an issue with one of the uh, example values used in a test. Um, I was, I received a message this night, I think, or this morning. I need to get back to him. I was busy this morning. Uh, but it's being worked on. Okay, so we have kind of a blocker. So there is no point in rushing 118 now. Well, there is a workaround, which is setting environment variable. So we could do that. Like I'm being running day 118 for a while now. Uh, I haven't had any other issue apart from that one. And every time I have that issue, I just you know, export uh, the environment variable that kind of is the workaround. Um, we also need it for automation controller, right? The same stuff. I'm not sure if I run 
if I had the same problem with automation control, because it's a specific test we have that has oh, a certain test we have. Okay, I got it. Test we have. So it's and it's just one specific place. Um, I haven't seen that anywhere else so far. And I've been running on Go one eighteen, I think, for two weeks and a bit. Yeah, I've also switched to it this week. I've built various components in Flux. I didn't notice any issue. I know that Go 118 has some performance issues when you use generics, uh, but we don't use generics. So uh, from our point of view, it shouldn't change anything uh, in terms of controllers. We just move forward and we we will unblock the Azure SDK update that we need. And the Azure SDK, he that told me they switched on Go 118 and they use generics. So we no longer can update it. So it's good to be uh, up to date with upstream. So uh, I don't want to rush this, but maybe by the end of this month, we should strive to have everything on 118 so we can update the Azure packages. Um, so I'm going to work on package, update everything there. Then I'm going to need some help from you to bump runtime in other controllers should if you use uh, the go mode update CLI utility should be uh, super easy to create that pull request. Any concerns about this? So if we manage to get OCI in, we'll have Two major, 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 major features in uh, the next Flux minor release. One, of course, is OCI support for Helm, and the other one is being able to trigger GitHub actions uh, from Flux events. Uh, there was a release pull request that I'm going to merge if I haven't done already in notification controller. Uh, and that, what this does, it uh, transforms our events into GitHub dispatch events, which is just um, a proprietary API of GitHub where you wrap, we wrap our own uh, event in the, inside their uh, structure. Uh, and we send that to the GitHub API and then inside GitHub Actions, when you define the on uh, trigger, you can say on dispatch, uh, and there you can uh, uh, look up the flux event that we actually need in GitHub Actions. So you can, see, you can um, run a GitHub Action depending on what customization was reconciled, the result of the reconciliation, did it fail, did it succeeded, which cluster is running on because you have access to summary and so on. And this enables uh, a lot of um, nice things that people were asking from Flux. Uh, for example, one, uh, one, one good example around this is you deploy a new version on staging, then you want to start a load test, right? And maybe your load test is, I don't know, GitHub Actions or somewhere else, right? So, Flux will apply the, the customization, then we'll call GitHub Action and GitHub Action will decide, oh, this is the new revision that I was waiting for. Let me start the load test and report uh, further on to, um, I don't know, to QA team or whatever, so they can move forward from staging to production or another stage. So it enables a, a couple of uh, nice integrations uh, from the Flux side. I'm quite excited about this. So those are the two main things. And of course, the uh, all the improvements around uh, image automation and libgit2. 
anything Absolutely. else Hide? would you like to to merge uh the uh, cube config logic in helm controller mm. well i think i would have someone confirm it first because it has it's like a, a a double solution right it first tries to do a and if that doesn't work there is a b attempt but the b attempt is basically uh, more expensive because then we look at the file system uh, on basically every initialization so if the user confirms that the initial fix basically solves the issue then i don't want to introduce the second one of course yeah i forgot you you also did the the thing where you look up the disk yeah yeah that's quite expensive and hopefully it will work without it okay so we we wait if if that user gives us feedback in time then we merge it if not we we are going to release all controllers anyway for the new uh, kubernetes uh, version it will be 124 and um, all controllers will also have uh, the future flag the future gates flag set up so we release it in this minor it's everywhere so from the next minor we can actually make use of future flags everywhere and we should definitely get rid of any environment variables or any other way we were doing uh, future flags until now and consolidate on on the same thing that kubernetes does i think it's a it's a better better solution than you know having so many environment variables everywhere um do we have uh actually two two things on that first do we know all the potential feature flags we already have across this space in flux yeah we don't have many of them no okay and the other point was around um so one of the comments you made recently Stefan, in one of my guys was about uh, dumping all the flags for each controller into you know some sort of documentation um so yeah ha, ha, it would be good if we manage to automate that somehow and also manage to get the um, i know how it can be automated we have our images uh, the websites are generated and we already have a set of uh, scripts on the website site which basically a kind of compile uh, documentation or get it and receive it from other places based on controller versions so if you would combine that to uh, with image references and then just simply literally run the image and then strip the last line from the output which is like uh, i don't know so you triggered this helm co help command string then you can literally render that into uh, a markdown document as a literal output and then you have your um, um, controller arguments documented um, as an easy fix. And do we have that somewhere already, like for parts of that? No. So we do uh, we do something more complex than that for the CLI. So we have a docsgen command in the CLI. Then we use uh, we use that command to compile the markdown directly. So. Uh, CLI knows how to output markdown for all the flags. Yeah, but that's based on P flag, and I think our controllers are on flag. No, 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 our controllers are, are on P flag. Are you sure? Yeah, it's on P flag. We there was an issue today only. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite positive. All right, uh, and. All right, I think that might be a you know separate point, but it would be good if you know all the things that I'm changing on the first implementation of uh, feature gate to actually somehow create that documentation in a way that we can also kind of push into you know whatever documentation we create automatically as well. Uh, I try to do that as you know as comments on on each one of the the feature gates. But I actually just shared one on up here. There's another one to to happen soon, but uh, would be good to get some sort of like review on that uh, with that in mind. 
Yeah, we have to see how uh, Kubernetes does it, how they uh, they clearly generate that uh, table with all the feature flags, with all the gates. Yeah. No one maintains that by hand. Um, but as a first step, we can definitely do what Hida proposed. We can run in, in our uh, website CI, all the controllers with minus minus help, capture the output and uh, dump it in a code block in a markdown and get that really fast on, on the docs. As website. a second step, if you want to have some human input around well, the introduction of the page, etc. What you could do is put the templates, except for the rendered part, into the repository so that they can have their own introductions, etc. There's already logic with which is able to pull in the markdown documents from places in those repository. And then while you run the output, you do a replace at the end of the file and put all the automatically generated dump from the um, binary output basically in there. Then you can have your own human introduction um, and maybe highlight some uh, feature flags manually for the moment because we don't have many of them. So it's, we can keep that up for now and then later figure out how to automate it. Yeah, also we have to maintain a page, an introduction page manually, where we specify there all the common flags. Um, also, the common flags could also be automated uh, from the package runtime. So we could get that list without having it type it manually. But what I think it will be useful for users to know that, OK, these are the flags that will work on any controller. For example, I don't know, the rate limit things, cube config, uh, uh, dependencies, and so on. But that's that's just a very small list that can be done at any time. Better is to first ha have all the flags available. So they can be searched on the website. Right now, you have to exec into a container, you have to download the container, exec into it, and run it with minus minus help just to see the flags, which is nothing but user friendly. Yeah, that makes sense. So, Sule, can you work on the OCI talks today? Yeah, I will do that. I, I would address all the comments that have been made today, for sure. Okay, so we will we'll revisit the decision to do a release or not tomorrow. Going to ping you all on Slack and we can decide then. Meanwhile, I'll, I'll try to do the package updates and releases. So even if we don't do a release, it's okay to upgrade client and everything else. It's not wasted time. Well, I think the last point that I had there that I'll just cover really quickly is about the optimized clone operations. So the PI is, is kind of ready for another review for everyone. Um, yeah, it, I think it, most people already kind of had a, a first look, but I'm really keen on getting that in as soon as possible um, and, and get people testing it before we release you know, uh, a future version or the next minor, really. 703, right? 713. Um, no, that would be, well, 665 is the one on optimized clone operations. Uh, so let me just share here again. Oh, 665, on. okay. Yeah, the one on 713, I want to merge. Oh, that's another major, Stefan, the optimized clone operations. Uh, 
Do you mean a minor? Oh, major feature. Oh, major feature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So overall, in terms of uh, improvements, I think that is going to be a big one. Uh, the one about the 713, which is disabling uh, cache connections, might improve, but I don't think it's like a major, major. Uh, it's, it's more like behind the scenes improving uh, reliability. Quite a few things we're doing on, on the Helm front might substantially improve memory footprint, but I, I don't think we're ready for a week and so or, or so. But I think we will, we should be able to drastically reduce the memory footprint once that is uh, landed. Okay, but 665 is not enabled by default, right? It's uh, behind the uh, future gate. Yes. Uh, unless we want to enable by default and just give folks an opt-out option, which again, it's quite easy now. Yes, yeah, I'm for enable this by default. So shall we do that? Yes, I mean, you just toggle the future flag, right? And in the docs say, if you have issues with this, please set the future flag to false. Basically roll back to the old version of source control because all the code is null. Brilliant, okay, I'll change that. So this one is, is the one we talked about here where we no longer do a full clone. Yes. So what this one will do is, is literally just get a quick request to the, the index of the repository, check if it's the same commit. If it is, then it will avoid any sort of clone. If it is different, we still use the same connection to then just do a fetch and a rebase. Uh, so regardless, it's going to be like a lot more efficient. Yeah. Yes especially for large repos, this is gold. <laughs> <laughs> and in theory, we can do something similar with Helm, with, you know, but we need with to- With the e yes, yes, with the yeah. last modified- uh, Very much, yeah. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think the documentation also needs to mention that this only works with uh, branches and tags. It doesn't work if you specify a sample range because of fairly complicated reasons. Uh, the gist of it is that when, if your server, uh, if your server tags, any of them include some build metadata, then we use, then there is no way to uh, <clears throat> determine precedence on which tag to use. If you have 1.01 plus build two and plus build one, then there is no way to figure out which one is the latest tag. The sample spec doesn't define that. So what we do at, at the current, at, uh, at the moment, we, what we do is we look at the commit timestamp of both those tags, and then we just take the latest one. The thing is, you can't get the commit timestamp without doing a full clone, like a full fetch, a full fetch of, all, of everything. So Semver doesn't have this, but tags and uh, branches do. Yeah. yeah, and and this was one of the things that well, so subscribe put a lot of time on and uh, did, did a great job, but then we realized that the effort to do the optimization on those specific scenarios was not worth the you know uh, complexity that it would add so so in the end we, we haven't gone for for that uh, right now we could do that in the future if we wanted uh, but the key thing is uh, for the other two we we have the ability i think the users making use of sample ranges on git repositories is slim as in, um, I think most users basically follow the head of a branch and are not so much uh, versioning their sets of deployments, basically, um, which is more a helpful thing to do. Yes, hopefully users will uh, use Semver when we add OCA support for... Uh... Yeah, but that's a more reasonable thing to but do it's easier for. to do it <laughs> yeah exactly it's like a packaging solution so you have to version with yeah. gits it's a bit unnatural you want to merge and then some action has to take place and tagging is an additional action post merge yes uh, and anyway flux bootstrap does not work with tags you need a moving target to bootstrap against so branch 
and this by default optimizes all the uh, all the bootstrap repos out there and I don't know, 99% of Flux users do use a Bootstrap repo, then they just don't install Flux directly on the cluster. So it's, um, it's a great improvement, but yes, we need to document the exceptions. Um, so I'm guessing that's a must before we merge this one. I think it's the same as for the OCI support. It must be properly described in the spec. In the spec, it should not take much time to add it to the spec now because you just have to add a logical entry to describe the behavior or the added thing. So, yeah. so Paolo, you'll have to add the documentation with the exceptions and also in there in the same documentation spot, add the future gate tell people how to disable this if they run into any issues. Um, cool, I'll do that. Pretty awesome work, by the way. Yes. It was, yes, it was loads of uh, people combined to get it there. So, uh, well, thank you everybody for helping. <laughs> Great. Like nice. In the future, we could also probably look into adding this optimization to image automation controller. Like that will be more difficult because we don't have a storage layer already present. And but yeah, we but could we probably still, look into that. We still want to consolidate all our Git solutions into something that's more generic. And basically we want to get rid of the one of the priorities for the image automation controller at the moment, I would say, is to break free of the source control dependency because it's very impractical. Um, and that basically means that the Git package there needs to move out because it's the best of our three Git packages we have, I think. Um, and then we need to add uh, push capabilities and um, either work with modifications on disk so that you don't have to create a, create a generic API uh, for modifications uh, for both uh, Git implementations or uh, well, you also need to create some sort of editing Git modification layer. Um, yeah, well, that's what needs to happen. I was checking the Flux to CLI. Even the Flux to CLI has its own Go Git code as well. Like it's just repeated code everywhere. Yeah, because it has to do writes. So if you solve the yeah. writes for the image automation controller, you can do the same for. Um, uh, the Flux2 CLI, and if the Flux2 CLI, even if the Flux2 CLI doesn't use libgit2, it can still only use the GoGit implementation and then not yeah. include libgit2. So that's not an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we need to make sure they are sub packages. And I think that's how they are currently in source control, right? Yeah, the source controller is structured so that you can leave one of the things out and then only just yeah. uh, import yeah, the other go thing. Go Git. Oh, no. Wait. Yeah. Oh, there might be an issue. I think libgit2, even if it's a sub-dependency that's not actively used in the code part, has some sort of build constraint check around libgit2 being available on the build system. But I'm not sure if that is triggered if you're not referring to the libgit2 um, sub-package at all. Yeah, Sanskar, you should test this thing. <laughs> Windows testing anyway, right? Because you are trying to do it. Yeah, so I'll take a look. You could tell us if it blocks everything or not. Uh, but yes, uh, ideally, we'll have a single Git package in Flux CD slash package that's used by the CLI, source controller, and image automation controller. And because right now we have in many places all sorts of logic around Git and it's, um, yeah, it's hard to maintain, especially image automation controller. It's also hard to release. We have to do not only an API release of, of source controller, we have to do a full blown release just to uh, move that code into uh, image reflector controller, which is not what we envisioned at the beginning. We, when we started Flux2 was only about having dependencies around APIs from one controller to another, but due to reasons we, we ended up here. So yeah, we should definitely fix it. Yeah, and another reason to consolidate is 
to have this great test coverage on just one set of packages because at the moment there's either a lot of test coverage I think now for source control it's great uh, but the other ones have due to the fair hardness of how to test Git uh, not so many tests I think yeah Quick. yeah it also help with test consolidation right because I I'm pretty sure we we have duplicates in source control and image automation control around cloning for example uh yeah although i would say that due to some of the complexities around the build you will end up in a controller or cli specific with controllers or cli specific tests anyway especially if you start to uh, fiddle with the uh, libca2 build configuration because that basically means that your um, how things work post uh, go basically into c will depend on how your configuration is constructed, which is uh, project specific. So you, for libgit2, you will end up with a set of tests anyway, which those could be factored out. Mm -hmm. We could create some sort of, um, well, testing thing that can basically be called within a project and runs a set of tests to ensure that it's compatible with our standards or something. Right. Yeah, anyway, if managed transport actually works with Azure DevOps and code commit, then we are, there are less things to worry in the CLI. We don't have to link to the Mac OS open SSH alternative and so on, right? It simplifies a lot, all things, but let's test and be sure that it actually works. 100%, yeah. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll make sure that once this is, is merged, but the, the, the PR that we talked about, I test again throughout, but I've been running that on, on my uh, clusters for a while and it's been all right. So yeah, it's going to be fine. Do you have a Windows machine, Paolo? No. no. That's the only thing I, I, I can't help. Yeah, maybe we can use the, uh, the Azure account that Microsoft gave us for flux what do you need windows for uh, to run the cli on windows with libgit to statically linked oh you can just download the vm from from the windows website and they offer it for free either to test out the internet explorer for ci reasons or to okay. test out their whole sdk for uh, development reasons um, and that works fairly well. It doesn't, uh, you don't have issues with virtualization throwing oh, weird nice. scenarios at you or something. Well, I yeah, have another Windows machine at home as well. I can, I, it's not mine, it's my brother's, but I can maybe figure, figure something out on that. Yeah, another option will be to uh, create a Windows VM on the Azure account that Microsoft gave us and give you the RDP access to it so you can remote connect it and run it there if you can get hold of a Windows machine at home. Okay, I think we are way over time. It was nice seeing everyone. And yeah. Be in touch tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. See ya. Bye. Bye. Take care.